that it's being recorded. That should come up on your screen. All right. Um, this evening's class is being brought to you by the City of Seattle's Trees for Neighborhoods program. Trees for Neighborhoods is a program of Trees for Seattle, the umbrella for all of the City of Seattle's urban forestry efforts. Trees for Seattle's commitment is to ensure that Seattle's urban forest is healthy, vital, and growing. Uh, my name is Jessica Farmer, and I manage the adult education programs for the University of Washington Botanic Gardens, and we're supporting this evening's class. Um, the presentation will be delivered by Lou Stubecki, who is the Trees for Seattle program manager. He works hard every year to help get 1,000 new trees planted in the city. Um, Lou's presentation will last until about 740, and then once he's gone through the slides, we'll both come on camera to discuss any questions that you all have submitted. So before we get started, I just want to go over a couple of logistics so you know how this is going to go. Um, this next slide here shows you how we'll handle the questions and answers for the workshop. You can submit your questions at any point during the presentation, and then we'll address those verbally during the Q&A session at the end. Um, the chat tool down there at the bottom um, is available for you to communicate just with us, with the panelists, me and Lou, uh, if you need any technical assistance. So if you're having trouble hearing things or seeing the slideshow, please let us know there. Um, also note in the lower left hand corner are your audio settings if you need to make any adjustments there. And then at the top here are your viewing options. So um, if you want to enter full screen in the upper right hand corner or any other adjustments that you need to make um, in order to be able to see the presentation well. All right, so with all that covered, I'm going to switch over to the presentation. Just a second here. And here's your video. Hello, and welcome to Trees for Neighborhoods Right Tree, Right Place Workshop. This is a tree and site selection workshop to help you with selecting trees through Trees for Neighborhoods and placing them where they will live and thrive in harmony in your urban environment. I am Lou Stubecki, the Trees for Neighborhoods Program Manager. Trees for Neighborhoods is a program within Trees for Seattle. In today's agenda, we will spend 40 minutes talking about Seattle's urban forest, tree planting questions you should be asking yourself, what you need to know when you're planting yard trees and street trees, and details about the Trees for Neighborhoods program in 2020. That should leave us 20 minutes for questions. What is an urban forest? It is all the trees in an urban area. This includes street trees. These typically are trees in the planting strip between the sidewalk and the curb, but they also include trees in traffic circles and trees in unimproved rights of way. Unimproved rights of way can be public stairways, abandoned or unpaved alleys, and green belts next to your home that are not owned by Seattle Parks Department. Speaking of which, yes, parks trees are urban trees as are trees in your yard, and trees on private and commercial property, some examples being cemeteries, shopping centers, universities, and businesses. Urban forests are planned, which is what you're doing now, they're planted, which you'll be doing later this year, and they're maintained, which you'll be doing throughout the lifetime of your trees. Let's talk about the benefits of the urban forest for our physical health, Trees provide cleaner air and water. Think of trees like filters for pollutants. There is a large body of studies on the positive effect of trees on our mental health. Trees provide beautiful, friendlier neighborhoods, safer, quieter streets, healthy, happier people. They do this by stimulating our parasympathetic nervous system and thus reducing stress. Reducing stress improves physical health and look at that, it's a positive feedback loop. Now may be a good time to tell you about Trees for Seattle. We are a tree and urban resource for Seattle residents. We help increase participation in planting and caring for trees on public and private property. We do this through volunteer events where we organize volunteers to care for trees in public places, we organize tree walks where we encourage people to go on or create an informative tree walk in any Seattle neighborhood. 
We also run the Trees for Neighborhoods program where we help you plant trees in your yard and right of way. We are here to help with your tree planting, care, and general tree questions. When is the best time to plant trees in Seattle? Fall is our tree planting season. As you can see from this graph, we get the most rainfall in October through December when trees are dormant. When you plant your tree, especially container trees, you end up cutting a lot of circling roots. This is necessary for best root development. Some folks think that spring is a good time to plant, but when the leaves unfurl in the spring, they send a hormone down to the roots that triggers new root growth. If you plant in the spring after the leaves come out, you will cut out this new root growth. Thus, planting in the fall is the least stressful for trees and allows for the best root development. So, what you want to do is plan now and plant in the fall. Questions you should be asking yourself are, why am I planting a tree? What site factors will influence my tree selection? What is the right tree for my site? Will it be a street tree or a yard tree? Will I get both? How will I care for the tree? Sometimes folks forget to ask about this one. Ask yourself if you can get water and mulch to the tree. Ask yourself if someone else can water for you when you are out of town. Let's go through some of these questions in detail. What are some of the reasons for planting trees? Well, for one, they provide shade for you and your home, thus reducing heat island stress, and thus reducing your home cooling costs. From personal experience, I can tell you we had a neighbor's tree that used to shade the west side of our house. When it fell apart in a storm, it was removed, and now that side of our house really cooks. Because of that, we ended up getting an air conditioner for our daughter's room, which is on that side of the house. Another reason for planting trees is to add beauty to your yard. Or perhaps you want to create a privacy screen. Conifers are great for this purpose. Remember, you can get up to four trees through Trees for Neighborhoods to help build your privacy screen. Maybe you want to build a sense of place with trees, some place you want to live. Trees help create memories. You may be planting trees for more wildlife habitat, or perhaps you're planting trees to stabilize slopes on your property. And this may not be a conscious goal, but maybe you're planting trees to help control stormwater runoff. What site factors will influence your tree choice? Basically, it's the available space above ground for the canopy and below ground for the roots. You need to keep in mind the mature size of trees you are interested in. Look at surrounding structures such as sidewalks, streets, your house, utility poles, and other trees. In this photo, we have a street light that SDOT regulations say you have to be at least 20 feet from. Over here, those same regulations say you have to be at least seven and a half feet from this driveway. You would be lucky if you could fit one tree in this planting strip. Light exposure is an important site factor to consider. Does your tree need full sun, which is more than six hours of direct sun? Your tree may require partial sun or shade, which is three to six hours of direct sun. A lot of trees are in this category. Our Pacific Northwest late day sun can be quite intense for a lot of trees. Some trees do well in shade, which is less than three hours of sun. Keep in mind this is indirect light. Don't plant your tree under heavy shade of another tree. Soil drainage is also an important site factor to consider. Is your soil light and fluffy? Is it compacted? Looking more closely at site factors, we should talk about utility lines. Do you have overhead high voltage lines over your planting strip? You will usually see them at the tops of the utility poles 35 feet up. That's right about here. The thicker communication lines at 20 feet and the service lines to your home are not high voltage lines. If you do have high voltage lines, you want to select a tree that matures at less than 30 feet in height. You also want to stay at least five feet away from all underground utilities. This includes sewer, water, gas, electric, and communication lines that are underground. You can look up your side sewer line using this website here.
I would like to point out that communication lines and service lines to your home are not high voltage lines. It is okay for trees to grow near and around these lines. On the left here, you have a service line that is going through the canopy of this tree. Now you can prune trees to create space within them to allow these lines to go through without a problem. On the right here, you have a communication line that is up against the trunk of this tree. Now these lines do have some stretch and it's okay for the tree to push on it. In time, the tree may push hard enough on it that the company has to come out and restring the line, but that is not a problem. So, what is the right tree for you? Look at your space and consider the mature tree shape and form that would fit. Columnar trees work well in tight spaces, short and wide trees do not. Consider whether you want an evergreen tree that has foliage all year long, or maybe a deciduous tree which drops its leaves in the winter. Evergreen conifers are the hardest working trees for our environment because they are controlling stormwater runoff and filtering pollutants and sound all year long. Let's take a closer look at tree size at maturity. Small trees are up to 30 feet in height. Medium trees are 30 to 50 feet in height. And large trees are considered anything over 50 feet in height. Large mature trees provide us urbanites with the most benefit don't be afraid of them, embrace them. If you have room for a large tree, please choose to plant one. If you plant a small tree in a large space, you are wasting benefit potential and you are denying a small tree to someone that only has room for a small tree. A note on spacing between trees. We tell people that small trees should be 15 to 20 feet apart. Medium trees should be 25 to 30 feet apart, and large trees should be 30 feet or more apart. This will vary due to mature tree width. Columnar trees can be spaced a little closer together. When selecting trees for the Trees for Neighborhoods program, we like to choose trees with very few pest problems. Some concerns for our region include emerald ash borer, this is a wood boring insect that kills every ash in its path. It's not here yet, but we are expecting it to arrive in the near future. We don't offer ash trees for this reason. Dutch elm disease. This disease ravages traditional elms like the American elm and the English elm. There are quite a few resistant elms that we have offered in the past, and we will continue to do so in the future. Bronze birch borer. This wood boring insect is currently wiping out European and Himalayan birches throughout Seattle. We have offered the resistant river birch in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Verticillium wilt. Japanese maples are very susceptible to this. That along with the high population of maples in Seattle is why we're currently not offering maples. Some of the things you will consider when evaluating aesthetics of trees include foliage. You may like the classic leaf shape of the white oak or the silvery fuzzy texture of the Amermachia's new leaves. The Skylands Oriental Spruce has yellow foliage, which is unusual for an evergreen conifer. And the red male pollen flowers really stand out against those needles. Speaking of flowers, the June Snow giant dogwood flowers aren't your typical dogwood shape. They form an umbel and the collection of them covers the whole tree looking like snow in June. Tree bark protects the trunk, but it also provides us with winter interest. You may like the smooth bark of the American beech or the stringy rough bark of Western red cedar. Let's talk about native versus non-native trees. I like to think of it as native and non-native trees. Some folks will ask, why don't we have more native trees? Well, we like native trees, but keep in mind that our urban environment is not a native environment. Non-native trees can tolerate tough urban environments and they offer more diversity of smaller trees. 
Given that, our native conifers make excellent yard trees. Just give them room to grow. This little dug fir this gentleman's looking at can turn into this big, beautiful tree. Keep in mind that Trees for Neighborhoods does not choose invasive trees such as English holly, cherry laurel, and European hawthorn. Are you thinking of choosing a yard tree or a street tree? Maybe you will choose both. Here's what you need to know. If you're planting a yard tree, you do not need a permit. You do need to call 811 to locate underground utilities. It will take them two days to paint the locates from the time you call. Keep in mind that you have to plant trees at least five feet from underground utilities. Select a tree that is right for the space. Take into consideration the proximity of your house and other structures. If you're planting a street tree, an S-Dot planting permit is required. We get that planting permit for you. We do not get tree removal permits for you. S-Dot stands for Seattle Department of Transportation. We will call A11 so SDOT can drive stakes in the ground where your tree will go. You will have to either take a photo of those locates to remember where they are, or you will have to call A11 again just before you plant. Pay attention to the planting strip with requirements for each tree. That info is on our website. Also, consider the proximity to utilities. Trees have to be at least 5 feet from underground utilities, at least 20 feet from light poles, at least seven and a half feet from driveways and at least 30 feet from intersections. I will show you how to measure that 30 feet later. What is a street tree? I briefly described them earlier. These typically are the trees in the planting strip between the sidewalk and the curb, but they also include trees in traffic circles and trees in unproved rights away, such as public stairways, abandoned or unpaved alleys, and green belts next to your home. Who is responsible for street trees? Well, if it's planted by the city, which is usually SDOT, then it's owned and maintained by SDOT. If the tree is planted privately, such as your Trees for Neighborhoods trees, then it is owned and maintained by the adjacent property owner, that's you. Regardless, they are all regulated by SDOT through permitting. You need a permit to plant a tree, remove a tree, and prune a branch larger than two inches in diameter or if you're pruning more than 15 percent of the canopy. If you need to remove a tree in the planting strip prior to planting a Trees for Neighborhoods tree, you need to apply for your own planting permit now. We do not get removal permits for you. Keep in mind that SDOT may not approve your removal if the tree does not meet their conditions for tree removal. Here is how you can contact SDOT. Let's talk about what you get with Trees for Neighborhoods. You get up to four trees a year for your property. The lifetime max for that property is six trees. If you have multiple properties, that applies to each one, and your property must be in Seattle. You get tree selection help, which is why you're here. Don't hesitate to reach out with additional questions. You get street tree permitting assistance. We apply for the planting permits for you. You get a watering bag and a bag of mulch for each tree you get. You get planting and care instruction prior to getting your trees. You get summer watering reminders for the next five years. And you are also offered a free young tree structural pruning workshop the year after you get your trees. What is your responsibility in this? Choose the appropriate tree for your space. Read about the trees. Learn about their mature sizes and shapes. Indicate on the application if the trees will be planted on the street or in your yard. Only plant trees in approved locations. Don't move a yard tree into the street or a street tree into your yard. For street trees, plant it where SDOT installs the sign. You may be able to vary it by a foot or so but don't move it five or 10 feet one way or the other. You must attend a planting and care webinar to get delivery of your trees. Properly plant the tree in the ground, and I say in the ground because sometimes people decide to turn them into container trees, and that's not what they're there for. 
Also, make sure to get them planted before the end of the year. You are responsible for all future maintenance such as watering, raking, mulching, and pruning. Here is the 2020 timeline for Trees for Neighborhoods. As you know, the application opened on July 13th. The application closes on August 10th. The Right Tree, Right Place webinars are Saturday, July 18th and Tuesday, July 21st. You're in one right now. The Planting and Care webinars are on Monday, September 28th and Wednesday, September 30th. You need to sign up for one of these when you apply. Here are some application tips. Submit only one application per household. Check with others that live in your home to make sure they haven't already applied. You can put a second person from your home on the application. If you have room, plant a larger tree. As I said earlier, if you plant a small tree in a large space, you're wasting benefit potential and you're denying a small tree to someone that only has room for a small tree. Only apply for the number of trees you have room for. Learn the mature dimensions of the trees you're interested in. Keep in mind the spacing between trees I mentioned earlier. Don't hesitate to ask for help in tree selection. Typically, we offer delivery assistance to folks that can't pick up trees, but this year is different. We will be delivering all the trees to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. We also offer planting assistance for those that have disabilities and are unable to plant the trees themselves. This may be limited this year due to COVID-19 concerns. Let's say you hear back from us after the application closes that you were approved for a tree but waitlisted for another. As the season progresses, people's plans change and they can sometimes cancel trees that were they were approved for. The tree you were waitlisted for may become available to you as late as October or November. If you aren't approved for a tree by then, you may decide to go to a local nursery to buy a tree or apply again next year. Let's take a look at the application. We start with an explanation of our plan to deliver trees due to COVID-19. We have helpful links to our website to help explain the program and explain how the lottery, also known as random selection, works. We also have an email here and our phone number. If you do happen to want to make a change after you filled out the application, do not submit another application. Get a hold of us and say, hey, Lou, can you change that one tree choice too? And I'll take care of it for you. Here you have basic contact info we need from you. Be sure to spell your email correctly. We have seen some gnail.coms with an N. You can add a second person from your household. Don't put your name in twice though. We already have it up here. Your planting address must be in Seattle. It helps us if you put your address in all caps. Don't put any periods in. Use abbreviations for street type and designation prefix suffix. For example, Avenue is AVE and Southwest is SW. In this example, we have place as PL and North is N. Add your zip code as well. Fill out the mailing address if it is different from the Seattle address where the trees will be planted. This is usually the case for people who own multiple properties. Let us know if you're planting the trees at a rental property and if you are the landlord or the renter. If you are a renter, make sure you have your landlord's permission first. Enter your phone number with area code and no spaces, dashes, or parentheses. You must choose and attend a planting and care webinar to get delivery of your trees. Add the date you choose in your calendar before you finish the application. We will begin delivery of the trees to your homes the following week. It'll take us about a month to deliver all of the trees to all of the addresses. Please be specific about where you want your tree, water bag, and mulch delivered on the property. Here we have helpful information about the next section on tree selection. You want to learn more about street trees? This link will take you there. 
We have individual links for each tree so you can learn more about them. And we have a link down here that takes you to that same information because you can never have too much info about tree selection. Here's where you select your trees and where they will be planted. These are drop down windows with all of your choices, including a blank space if you need to erase a tree. This is not an order of preference. If you fill out all four slots, you may be awarded all four trees. You need to pick if the tree will be in your yard or along a street. Your choice will go into the database. The procedures for yard trees and street trees are different, so please don't change them after you get your tree. You may decide it's a good idea to write down the trees you chose and where you chose to plant them. You also need to let us know if there are high voltage wires overhead. If you choose a western red cedar and indicate there are high voltage wires overhead, we'll be getting a hold of you to change your choice. If you choose a street tree, give us detailed instructions on where you plan to plant the tree. SDOT uses this info when they are evaluating your planting sites. Click Done when you finish. You will get this window when you click Done. You do not get a confirmation email. This is why we ask you to add the Planting and Care webinar date to your calendar before you finish the application. Click Done again and you get this window. Now you are truly finished with the application. Here are the 2020 trees. We have great details about these trees on our website. We call our conifers yard trees, but you can plant them on the street if you have a 12 foot wide planting strip and no overhead high voltage wires. They would be great for unimproved rides away. The grand fir is a tall native conifer. You can plant it in full sun to light shade. The western red cedar is also a large native conifer. Don't put it in a hot, dry spot. The Skylands Oriental Spruce matures at a smaller size than the others. It gets about 40 or 50 feet. Give it some morning sun and afternoon shade so that you don't burn that beautiful yellow foliage. We call these medium to large deciduous trees street trees, but you can plant them in your yard too. They cannot be planted under high voltage lines. The June Snow Giant Dogwood does well in light or open shade to part sun, morning sun preferably. It can get up to 40 feet high, so don't plant it under high voltage wires. If you're planting in the street, it needs a six foot wide planting strip. The Emerald Avenue European Hornbeam has great leaf texture and is a tough tree for hot spots once it is established. It requires a six foot wide planting strip. The American Beech is a great shade tree. It can tolerate some shade at first, but eventually it will want some sun and room to grow. May requires an eight foot wide planting strip. The white oak is also a large shade tree. Plant this magnificent specimen in full sun. It has a bronze to red fall color and it requires an eight foot wide planting strip. The tulip tree is a magnolia relative that has a unique flower of understated beauty. This is a tall tree that you can plant in full sun, but don't let your soil dry out. It also requires an eight foot wide planting strip. These small deciduous trees are allowed under high voltage wires. If you are planting them on the street, they require a minimum of a five foot wide planting strip. Keep in mind that you may not have a high voltage line overhead, but your planting strip may only be five feet wide. If that is the case, you would have to select one of these trees. The Amur Macchia is tolerant of tough urban conditions. Plant it in full sun. It has unique features such as shiny bark, fragrant white flowers, and fuzzy emerging compound leaves. A compound leaf has many leaflets that make up a leaf. The Chinese fringe tree can grow in sun or shade. Give it morning sun and afternoon shade. It has lightly fragrant fringy white flowers and attractive peeling bark. The spring showers Japanese snowbell 
as dark green leaves and beautiful white bell flowers that are fragrant. Also plant this with morning sun and afternoon shade. The City Sprite's alcova is a miniature version of a larger tree. It has great fall color. You can plant this in full sun. Let's do some practice decision making. This looks to be a 10 to 12 foot wide planting strip in a sunny spot. These wires are just communication wires so we can get a large tree in here, perhaps a white oak or a tulip tree. You want to stay five feet from the water meter box and seven to eight feet from the cement sidewalk here. I went and centered directly under the service line to the home. In time, the lowest branch of either of these trees would be above the service line. But this looks to be like a good spot for the tree. Here we have a corner property with two planting strips. The planting strip on the left appears to be eight feet wide and west facing. There are no overhead high voltage wires. So here you could put a white oak or a tulip tree. Uh, if it isn't too hot a spot, the American beech would work too. Uh, the planting strip on the right is the same width, but it does have high voltage lines. You would end up choosing one of the power line friendly trees like the Amramachia, the Chinese fringe tree, spring showers, Japanese snowbell, or the city sprite Zelkova. Remember that all trees have to be at least 30 feet from the intersection. You measure that from an imaginary line that you draw extending from the curb. In this case, those lines are already drawn for you. But for example, if we wanted to measure 30 feet from this intersection here, we would use this line extending from this curb. You come out here and then you measure 30 feet on down and that's where your first tree could go. You may have room for another tree further down. It's hard to really say. But the reason why they don't want you to have trees closer than 30 feet to the intersection is to make sure that they're not obscuring sight lines when cars approach the intersection. So for this uh, planting strip here, you would use this imaginary line and you would measure 30 feet in this direction. And you know, you'd probably have room for one tree before you ran into all this other plant material over here. In this situation, the right of way is this heavily compacted area, just this side of the hedge. There is no way you're going to be able to plant a tree in there unless you jackhammer that all up and backfill with some real soil. You're better off planting a tree on the other side of the hedge between the hedge and the house. Just make sure that you're at least 15 feet from the house. I think you'd end up planting a little closer to the hedge, quite honestly. Let's assume that this is rich, moist soil. It's large enough space that you could accommodate a medium sized tree like the June snow giant dogwood, as long as it's not too hot. It may even be large enough where you could put a Western red cedar there. Again, as long as it's not too hot. At first glance, this looks like a big space. A closer look shows that there is another tree over here at the right edge. Assuming it's a shade loving small ornamental tree, you could go with a larger shade tree or even a conifer. Just be sure to be at least 20 feet away, maybe up here closer to the camera. Also, don't plant in the gravel area next to the fence. Ideally, you should be at least 15 feet from the fence. So it's possible you could fit a bigger tree in here. Depth reception makes it difficult to tell with this photo or you may end up having your larger tree up here. Here is a large backyard. There's a lot to work with here. You could easily set up a framework with two large trees that are 30 to 40 feet apart. Maybe two conifers or one conifer and a tulip tree. Let's assume the soil is moist in most places, but a little wet over here in the corner. You could put a Western red cedar at the edge of the wet area, not in it, but at the edge, and then put another tree 30 or 40 feet from that western red cedar. 
As the trees get established, you may come back to trees for neighborhoods in later years to fill in with some smaller ornamentals around those. Well, that's it, my friends. Never hesitate to reach out to us for advice, whether it's in regard to finding the right place to plant trees or any of your other tree questions. Here are some additional tree-related resources. If you feel that you missed anything, we plan on posting the video recording of this presentation on the Trees for Neighborhoods website. Thank you for taking the time to learn about right tree, right place. Now let's answer some questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lou. That was terrific. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have had a few questions come in during the presentation and um, folks who are on the line, feel free to submit any more questions as we go along. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start going through some of those. So Lou, um, why is the river birch not on the list of trees this year? Because we couldn't get it. Uh, I would love to hmm. have it. Um, so I sent out a bid uh, with a list of trees we want and river birch and, and other uh, like cultivars of the river birch are on that list. And this year I couldn't get enough of them from any one supplier. So um, I would like to have had them. So but there's a possibility I might be able to get another river birch cultivar called Dura Heat next year if all goes well. So we'll see. Next year. Great. And, and I think um, what I've seen being involved with this program for the last several years is you do try and change the list every year just to continue to increase that diversity in the urban forest. That is true. Um, we do. Yeah. Um, how come there aren't any fruit trees on the list? Uh, something I should have addressed in the presentation and I apologize. But um, there are two reasons why we've gone away from fruit trees. Uh, one of them is that a lot of fruit trees get insect and disease issues that sometimes require spraying of chemicals and we don't want to burden our participants with that kind of uh, maintenance problem of having to spray trees for diseases and insects. You know, our goal is to choose trees that have minimal number of problems and unfortunately fruit trees are not in that category. So the other thing is that a lot of fruit trees tend to be dwarf and small and if they're not people tend to pack them pretty hard to keep them that way so they can reach fruit and with that then the trees aren't really contributing to our canopy goals and that, that's a really important thing that we we want to promote more canopy out there and fruit trees just don't cut it in that way. So not to say that we don't support fruit trees. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get fruit trees on your own and you have questions for us, we're here to help. So keep, keep in mind that the trees for Seattle part of this program is we answer your questions if you got them. And if we can't, we farm out to some source that will, like say the plant answer line at the U University of Washington Botanic Gardens. So, um, so yeah. Keep that in mind if you're looking for your own fruit trees. Great, thanks Lou. Um, let's see, there's some great uh, questions coming in. Um, another one just while we're still on kind of tree species, um, what trees can be planted on sloped hillsides for uh, soil stabilization? Hmm, uh, I, I would say definitely our native conifers would work well in that situation. Um, they tend to produce some wide ranging surface roots that help. Uh, that's why we, we say that if you're going to plant a conifer in the planting strip, that it has to be at least 12 feet wide mm. to make room for those oh, wide-spreading yes. surface yeah. roots. So, um, but definitely, yeah, our native conifers would be great for stabilizing hillsides. And um, I know I've heard you talk about it before. Sometimes there's questions. Do you want to talk a little bit about planting on a slope? Yes. Yeah. Planting on a slope is, is uh, a challenge, but there is a method and it works fairly well. The key is that you want, it, you want the tree to be straight. So consider building like a plateau uh, for that tree, a little, little ledge where the tree's gonna go in. So what you're gonna do is carve a little out of the hill side and you're gonna put a little bit on the downhill side to build up so that you have this platform for your tree. The other thing you wanna do is protect that downhill side platform from eroding with heavy rainfall uh, and your own watering. So what you would do is I like to take stakes and put them into mm -hmm. the soil to help hold it at the, at the toe of that. 
And then I also would cover it with the mulch that you're going to get from us. And maybe you need additional mulch for that. Uh, the other thing you can do is uh, put jute on it and then mulch over top of that. So. Okay, great tips. Thank you. Um, all right, so I know parts of our city, um, there aren't any sidewalks or even curbs necessarily. So how far from the curb or, or the street edge um, would a person need to plant uh, to in their yard so that the tree wouldn't be considered a street tree? You would have to, it's gonna be different for every mm -hmm. plat, every street. Um, ideally what you would need to do is uh, find out where your property line is. Sometimes you can tell you, you might look down the sh your street and look at all the neighbor's properties and you'll maybe see a semblance of a fen like fence rows and rock walls. Sometimes that's it. Uh, another thing you can do is measure 30 feet from the center of the street. Um, and that might be where your property line is. It's not a guarantee. Uh, the last thing you could do is get a hold of SDOT and they can look it up for you. Um, and if that doesn't work, you can get a hold of me. Mm -hmm. I'll look it up for you. Yeah. Now I've looked at the King County parcel viewer before to get an idea because that that overlays the property lines over a Google Maps image. Um, oh, yeah. Have you have right. you found that to is that uh, reliably accurate to know where your property? I, I haven't level? used it because I, it doesn't have a measuring tool, if I recall. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I use GIS because I use that as a tool for a lot of things. And so GIS is more accurate, I can, I can tell with that. But SDOT has it too, and the fact they have a better version of GIS, that they can give you a really good, accurate representation of where your property line is and tell you, okay, yeah, your property line is 10 feet from the edge of that paving, paved area. So I definitely would check with them first. Great, thank you. And if anybody has questions about these things um, and didn't catch Lou's contact information to follow up, just so you know, we'll be putting that back up at the end of the Q&A session. So um, here's a question about kind of how the lottery and the application process works. Uh, if, yes. if you apply for three trees, do you get put into the lottery for each tree? Or if you can't get all three, you don't get any. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? Yes, the way the lottery works is, uh, I'll start from the beginning. So we, we went to a lottery because folks were complaining that the early bird was getting the worm. Sure. You know, if they applied later, you know, they were on vacation or they get a chance, they just found out, they applied later, they weren't getting any trees. So to make it fair to everyone, we have this lottery so that whether you apply on the first day of the application period or the last day of the application period, your chances are equal of getting what you want. So what happens is once we close the application, we take the, the applications from SurveyMonkey and export them to our database and then it's run through a random number generator and they're spit out in random order into our database. And then I just start filling the orders in that order. So um, so what happens is the first, obviously the first group of people are gonna get everything they ask for. So then as you, get, as you start to run out of trees, and that tends to be the small ornamental trees, the ones that are under, that are good for under high voltage, as we run out of those, then like you may apply for it and you might get the bigger tree you asked for, but you might be waitlisted. And that's the word you'll get in your, your status email. You, you may be waitlisted for that smaller tree. So that doesn't mean you're not going to get that tree. It means that at the moment you don't have it. What may happen, as I mentioned in, in the presentation, is someone may say, oh, I've, some plants came up. I can't plant anymore. I'd like to give my tree up to the next person in the waitlist. Or when SDOT evaluates street sites, someone who wants to plant four trees in a 40 foot space, they have to give some of them up and then they become available to people who want them. So, um, so don't give up. If you're waitlisted on a tree, there's a good possibility that I could be calling or emailing you and saying, you got your tree. So All right. I feel good when I do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and how many applicants usually apply every year? Uh, we get about, 800 uh roughly about 800 applicants apply every year and you know keep in mind that each a lot of them are asking for multiple trees uh not everyone some folks just want one tree because that's what works for them so all right now here's uh someone with the situation so the site for my tree is just shy of the recommended width for the medium trees uh, my neighbor has trees on the fence line my garage is on the other side 
I was considering the dogwood or the tulip tree. Would these be okay or should I reconsider? We want a shade tree for our empty sunny yard. Excellent question. So it depends on how shy it is. So for example, with the uh, tulip tree, that requires an eight foot wide planting strip. If you have a seven or seven and a half foot wide planting strip, I recommend applying for it anyway, and here's why. SDOT will come out and evaluate your site, and they will put a yellow mark on it saying, mm, it's just a foot shy. Then I'll come back to you and say, SDOT would approve you planting it here if you put root barrier mm. between the sidewalk and the planting strip. The root barrier is this plastic sheeting. Uh, you can buy it online. Uh, ideally, SDOT would want you to put an 18 inch deep root barrier. So it's a thin plastic sh um, sheet and it's 18 inches deep and you put it not around the tree. Please don't do that. People do that and it's horrible for trees. Put it at the edge of the sidewalk and the curb. What you're trying to do is prevent the root from going directly under the sidewalk to lift it. This is why they have these recommendations. So you know, it would hit the, the, the root barrier and then go down and under. So in an ideal world. So. Now yeah. Um, now, just in case, because I'm not entirely sure of this question, but this person may be asking about a, this tree for their yard, not necessarily as a street tree. So what about oh, okay. in that I misunderstood. case? misunderstood. Well, it's not, it's not clear, but what if, what if your space in your yard is just shy of what's the recommended width? Um, well, um, you may consider a root barrier yet again. Um, you may consider a smaller tree. Uh, think, remember, just um, picture these trees at their mature size. So for example, you know, if I'm saying the, um, the June snow dogwood is a 40 foot tall tree, could get up to 30 feet wide, depending on the situation you put it in. Uh, imagine 40 by 30 in that spot. You know, if it's growing into the neighbor's um, deck, uh, not a good choice then. So, so just do some visualization, extrapolate to see that full size of the tree. Um, and Kim, one thing I'll just say quickly about the June snow giant dogwood. It is a tree of, of great variation. If you put it in light shade, um, where it's never really getting a lot of direct sun, it will grow taller and skinnier. And it'll form this sort of like tiers, like a parasol, like here's one level, then a lot of growth, then another level. And it's really kind of cool looking. If you put it in more sun, you do risk the chance of burning it a little bit, but you'll get a fuller growth and, and quite wide as a matter of fact, so. Um, there's a couple questions here about wondering about full sun, hot planting spots. Um, one person is asking about compact clay soil in full sun, um, asking if the tulip tree can handle the full sun and hot planting spots. Um, otherwise, do you have any other recommendations um, from this year's list? You know, once a tulip tree is established, it can handle full sun. You see them in full sun a lot. The key is that you want to water it very well during this establishment, excuse me, establishment period. That's five years. So if you do neglect your watering during that time, you will see some suffering if it's in a full sun. But I, again, you can put them in full sun, just keep on top of the watering. A lot of these trees are like that. Once they're established, they do much better. Even some of the tough trees that we choose, like the Emerald Avenue European Hornbeam and the Amur Macchia, and these are, tough trees for tough sites. You know, you got clay soil, kind of not the greatest, lots of sun. They'll do fine, but doesn't mean they'll do fine without you watering through neglect. And they're not uh, trees that need, that they want you to neglect them. You still got to water to establish them. Then they'll do their, their awesome performance, so. All right. And what about, um, would there be any concerns with planting a tree above or near a retaining wall? Hmm. Above a retaining wall, I, I'm going to say not to worry. Now, some people, I've seen a lot of yards where people have you know, this big retaining wall along the sidewalk, and there's the yard behind it, and the wall's cracked. And if there's a tree, everyone blames the tree. Well, guess what? I've seen plenty of yards with no tree, and, the, and just the sheer volume of that soil is pushing on the wall and cracks it. So don't blame the tree. You're okay. Go ahead and do it, I say. Uh, that's on the top side, right? Now, next to it, I don't think you'll run into a big problem. If you're too close, though, you may 
have some roots that would end up lifting it. Again, use those parameters that we mentioned in the presentation and that are on our website. Um, so you did mention, I, I know we're not doing fruit trees through this program, but you did say you're willing to answer fruit tree questions. So um, what, what fruit trees do best in Seattle? <laughs> okay, pawpaws and persimmons. Boom. <laughs> there you go. Lou's favorite fruit trees. Yeah, they do, they do well. Now, yeah. do, uh, we know persimmons produce quite a bit of fruit here. Uh, pawpaws, I'm not so sure. I've seen some here and there, but it's not a prolific fruiter. But uh, I would like to save time for um, other questions related to the program. So sure thing. Uh, if and someone it, wants yeah. to pick my brain some more afterwards, um, send me an email. That would be great. And uh, I can talk more about fruit trees. You know, as, uh, anything in the rose family, you're going to run into a lot of uh, disease and insect issues. Rose family being apples, pears, peaches, nectarines, cherries. So there we go. Okay, now I'm going to stop. All this. right, and and it's so fine. I would I would also just point people to some great resources in the Garden Hotline at Tilth Alliance, the Plant there Answer Line that's at the Miller Library at UW Botanic Gardens, and um, the Seattle Tree Fruit Society um, have, and I think the Western Washington Fruit Tree Research um, out of WSU. Um, Excellent. All have recommendations for Western Washington fruit trees. Um, so uh, if, if pawpaws and persimmons aren't what you're looking for, you can see if you have some other recommendations there. Um, okay, so, oh, here is a good question that I saw. Um, what about if I have a green space that's adjacent to my home? Can I apply for trees to plant there? Absolutely. And check to make sure, uh, so that green space could be parks property but more than likely it's what we call an unimproved right of way. Therefore, it's regulated by SDOT and you would apply for it as a street tree. And so the SDOT would come out and inspect that. We've had quite a few people who do that over the years um, and it's a great place for trees. Now, sometimes that right of way could be because it's got overhead high voltage wires. So you might have to choose a smaller tree, but sometimes it doesn't. And therefore I would say, choose one of our native conifers for that spot. That would be excellent place for them. And they're usually slopes. Sometimes they're steep slopes. And also another unimproved right away that's a great place to plant is along stairwells. Those mm -hmm. are SDOT right ways. And um, so definitely planting trees along there. Again, our native conifers are good because you can limb them up over time so that people can walk underneath them. And uh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, now, what if I have a street tree, um, an existing street tree, and I want to replace that? What's that process look like? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you would need to apply to SDOT okay. to remove that tree now. Now, keep in mind, they have um, some criteria for removal. They're not going to say, oh, yeah, you can remove that because you don't like the color purple anymore, or you're tired of breaking leaves, or if your sidewalk's broken, or your sewer's you believe your sewer is being clogged. And there's a lot of details involved in that I'm not going to get into. But the two things that they will say, oh yes, you can remove and replace this tree, are one, the tree is really poor in health or near death. And two, there is a structural defect in the tree that would cause it to fall apart and create damage to property or person. So those are the two criteria they look at. Um, and if your tree falls in that category, then definitely apply. I mean, if you're not sure, apply anyway, because they have professional arborists who will come out and evaluate and let you know exactly why they will or won't approve removal of your tree. All right. Um, now, if folks have questions beyond this presentation and they would like to email you a photo of their spot um, to get a recommendation, are you willing to do that? I am willing. Great. Yeah, definitely. If you got some issues, email me and uh, and I, I may be able to help you out. You know, if it's on the back property, definitely take good photos um, and even try to just like, if you can somehow just label, hey, this is looking north. If not, you know, maybe we talk on the phone, walk me through it. Uh, if it's in your front yard, take some photos, but maybe let me know your address so I can look it up in Street View. Uh, and I might be able to see quite a bit from Street View to help out, so. Okay, cool. 
Um, here's another question that's come in. I have an existing yard tree and I'd like to plant a tree in the right of way across the sidewalk. Will I run into trouble? Um, what's your yard tree? Like what's, what is it? Is it, let's just say it's an oak tree and, and it's going to get its mature size is say 40 feet wide and 60 feet tall. It's an Asian um, pear. Okay, all right. Um, well, consider how wide that Asian pear is gonna be. Uh, and then at its maturity, and then the tree you wanna choose from us, consider how wide that will be at its maturity, and then will the two meet? A little meeting is never bad. You know, trees aren't afraid to touch each other. You know, a little bit's okay, but, um, but you don't want them really impacting each other too much. So uh, again, we always say, learn about your trees, learn mature size, and shape and that'll help you figure things out but trees do not have strict social distancing requirements no they don't another. oh that's a good one jessica good. <laughs> uh. well we can be glad for that um okay let's see so it looks like we've we've run out of um attendee questions if you've got any more burning questions um now is your opportunity while we're waiting to see if anything else comes in i'm going to go ahead and put Let's see, share my screen to put Lou's contact information back up one more time. And I'll just say to everyone, thank you for participating. Thank you for caring about getting the most out of your trees. And that's why you're here. And I, I greatly appreciate it. I wish I could see you all like in a live class, but um, maybe sometime again in the future. Yeah, yeah. All right, so there's the contact information. Yes, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, Look forward to any follow-up questions going to Lou and um, hope to see your applications come in for trees for this fall. Um, and, and thank you, Jessica, for doing such an awesome job. You're a great partner in this. I so do appreciate it. You bet. It's a great program to be a part of. Thanks, Lou. Yep. Bye, everybody. Ciao.